Welcome, all of you, to the Hingham Heritage Museum, the home of the Hingham Historical Society. I see some new faces here, and that's terrific. This has become quite a lively place. Lots going on, whether you want to do personal research or come to events like this, uh, you know, visit the, the, the store. There's many things going on. And so we welcome all of you to become members. If you want to learn more about the museum, any of us with with these badges on can help you out or anyone at the door, uh, but welcome. Uh, so happy to see you all here. This is the third in a seven-part series, our 2019-2020 20, uh, lecture series, Waves of Change, uh, and we have had another sellout crowd today, so that's terrific. My name is Eileen McIntyre, and I am honored to serve on the board of the Hingham Historical Society and to co-chair with Elizabeth Danis, who's standing at the door there, the Society's Education Committee. The committee chose the period between the middle of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th century to focus on for our lecture series over the course of this next year because it represents a period of such extraordinary change in our town. Much of this change is reflected in the people and places that are such an important part of our town today. And our topic this afternoon is a really terrific example of that. Our two speakers today will share a fascinating and sometimes surprising array of photos, maps, and stories about an important part of our town's 20th century history that has left a lasting imprint in the form of Bear Cove Park and Wampatuck State Park. Today's program also will provide insights on lesser known aspects of US naval history in the first half of the 20th century. And I'll now introduce both of our speakers. They will speak one after the other, but I'll, I'll introduce them both now. First, Scott McMillan, who you see there on the left. Scott's father, Carlisle McMillan, who was known as Mac, was stationed at the Hingham Naval Ammunition Depot, then situated along the Back River, as a staff sergeant with the US Marine Corps detachment after he returned from World War II service in the Pacific. The family lived nearby on Fort Hill Street. As a child, Scott rode his bike to the gatehouse often to get permission to enter the depot. And once inside, he could play with the children of the commander of the base, who lived at what is now the home of the South Shore Conservatory. Scott graduated from Hingham High School in 1968 and served in the Marines before joining the Hingham Fire Department in 1973. As a firefighter, Scott served as the superintendent of the fire alarm, using the electrical training he acquired while in the service. Scott and his wife Cheryl raised two sons in Hingham. He retired in 2003 from the fire department and was presented with the Robert B. Olson Award for Outstanding Service. Today, Scott is a part-time park ranger at Bear Cove Park, serves on the Hingham Veterans Council, and as commander of the Hingham American Legion post 120. He also is a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars and chair of the trustees of Hingham's GAR Hall. Among Scott's honors are his selection in 2009 as Veteran of the Year for Hingham and in 2015 as Citizen of the Year selected by the Hingham Journal. Most importantly though for the topic of today's program is Scott's role in 2009 in co-founding the Green Dock Museum at Bear Cove Park, a fascinating place to visit if you want to learn about the rich history of Camp Hingham and the US Navy Ammunition Depot and Annex, about which we'll hear quite a bit today. Our second speaker will be Jim Rose, who co-founded the Green Dock Museum with Scott. Jim was born in 1946, but his parents, James and Dorna Rose, met at the Hingham Naval Ammunition Depot where they both worked during World War II. His father was an ordnance leading man from 1941 to 1962. His work at the depot included top secret projects such as the VT fuse and guided missile assembly, both of which we'll hear about today. His mother worked in the rocket plant assembly line. Jim was raised in Rockland and Quincy. He received his BA in geography from Boston University in 1970 and then served during the Vietnam War as a cartographer for the US Corps of Engineers. In 1973, he transferred to the Air Force Reserve and became a public affairs officer. 
He retired from his military service at Hanscom Air Force Base in 1996, and Jim then worked as a graphic designer for several local ad agencies and high-tech firms before retiring in 2001. Jim and his wife Cheryl live in Hopkinton. He has published several papers on military history, such as Hingham at War, Oral History of New England Combat Veterans, and Surviving New England's U-Boat War. Jim currently serves as the Friends of Wampatuck news editor and Wampatuck Park historian. We thank both Scott and Jim for their service to our country and to our community. Their formal remarks today will run about an hour or so, leaving some time for questions. So now let's welcome Scott McMillan. Thank you, Eileen. Well, as we can see, John Davis, Governor John Davis from uh, Hingham, also was the Secretary of the Navy from 1897 to 1902. And uh, anyway, he, um, he was the Secretary of the Navy in a time when things were starting to go build up around here. And uh, he and Teddy Roosevelt, who was the, uh, he really didn't get along with Teddy Roosevelt. And um, when Teddy Roosevelt became the president in uh, 1901, they kind of had an outfalling and um, it caused Governor Long to uh, resign his post as Secretary of the Navy. But we think that he may have already got started in uh, getting this show on the road with the uh, Hingham Ammunition Depot. Um, they were looking for a place up and down the, uh, the East Coast to, um, to build a Naval Ammunition Depot. Uh, this is ha happens to be John Long's house on Cottage Street. There's a uh, bird sanctuary across the street from number 48 Cottage Street. You can still go there today. It's one of Hingham's parks. So here's the origin of the uh, park. Um, you can see they, they went up and down the East Coast. And in 1903, they decided on Hingham as a, as a space because of uh, the rolling hills and um, a lot of its closeness to the water, the rail lines, and all kinds of uh, things that would make it a, a nice spot for a Navy base. These are some of the newspaper articles. Um, back, in that, back in the day, it, it explains some of the properties. You can't really read that. It gives the uh, acreage and the, um, and the amount of money that the people were paid when the Navy took them by eminent domain. Um, some of the uh, acreages were over 100 acres at the time, so they were uh, pretty sad to see that the people that owned it were pretty sad to see it go. Um, but as, as it is today, it's kind of a nice spot to, uh, to, to, to walk and visit, and um, otherwise it would have been all built up with, with houses and stuff along the river. This is some of the property, uh, the different properties, and the green is the Hingham side, the blue is obviously the river, and on the Weymouth side, the uh, Great Esca Park, and you can see the different plots of land. Um, some of them are pretty large. Uh, one of them was owned by Reuben Hersey. Uh, I believe that was close to 100 acres or a little over. And uh, that was taken in, I believe, 1906. We have a list of all of the, the Hingham names of the people who uh, owned property there and what the Navy paid them uh, at the park in the, uh, in the museum. Here you go, some of the, okay, Reuben Hurst, he had over 100 acres. There's a, there's a group, over 100 pieces of property in Hingham were taken by the Navy. And there were, like I say, fishing lodges, there were all kinds of farms, everything else along the, uh, the river's edge, uh, hunting, hunting lodges. Uh, Camp Hingham now is another part of the park. Um, in, in 1909, Camp Hingham opened up. Uh, they were kind of figuring out what was going to be done down the road. They knew Europe was getting ready for battle and uh, you know unrest over there. So uh, they built Camp Hingham, which uh, trained about 600 men at a time in the Navy. And uh, they also took, uh, on, in 1917, they, uh, they took um, Bumpkin Island, they, it was a hospital for children, a children's hospital, and they took Bumpkin Island and uh, 
They made that into another camp, and it was a hospital uh, for any, any um, infectious diseases. If any of the soldiers got infectious diseases, they could put them out there, which didn't happen. So they made it another training station, and that, that took about 1,750 soldier, uh, sailors at a time over there. This is the site of the World War I pier, 1914. You can see the, uh, the bridge in the background is the Back River Bridge. Um, that bridge was a pivot bridge. It, it, it turned and uh, would let the barges come in and then out. And the, uh, the building that you see on the far left is the, um, is the dock house for that particular um, pier. So they were leveling the land. You can see the little bit of water on the right, and they, they filled in and leveled it all up. This is a picture of the uh, barracks at the uh, Camp Hingham. And uh, these are all wooden barracks. Uh, I think the next slide actually shows a little bit better. That's basically the same picture um, with walkways around. And they had each, each group of um, barracks would hold about 200 sailors, and they had three different groups of buildings, so they could put out about 600 sailors at a time. And um, as the war got started, they actually brought in tents and they added to that. So uh, it, it, it held quite a few more than the 600 that it was originally built for. This is the uh, parade deck. Uh, you can see the barracks is on the left. This is the mess hall in the middle on the right side. Um, the YMCA is off further to the right, was connected to the mess hall, and uh, that's where the gentleman could go and, um, and write letters and they could buy postcards and, and all kinds of stuff and send them home. So you see the YMCA is, there's the mess hall again, the YMCA is, is tucked down to the right, it's about right in the middle of that photograph. These, these pictures were all black and white and they've been colorized to kind of make it stand out a little bit better. These are two pictures from uh, 1918. The top picture is the, uh, called the ship's company. Those would have been the sailors that uh, would have worked at the base. You see the ones in the white on the right there, they would have been the uh, cooks. And the ones in the middle, uh, you can see the, the Dixie caps, they would have been uh, the workers. Then you've got the middle part uh, with just the sailors. They were probably the, uh, the training, training staff. On the left, you've got the, uh, the band. And I believe the fire department was in there somewhere. That, that picture is actually much longer than what you see there. The bottom picture is one of the graduating classes that would have gone through there about 1918. This is a bunch of the civilian workers that uh, the base hired. Uh, there was about 2,000 civilian workers that worked in there at the maximum. Um, and that, that was right around World War II, 1944 or so. In between the wars, they had the WPA, which is the, uh, the Work Progress Administration. All right, back to World War I. There, that was the, um, there's a better picture of the YMCA tucked in at that far end of the building with some of the, uh, some of the sailors and some of the civilian, uh, probably teachers and stuff. This is inside the mess hall in the, uh, in the kitchen. This is the uh, main gate at the Hingham Naval Ammunition Depot, probably on Fort Hill Street by Thomas Auto Body, where it is now. It's a little different uh, look than what it is. Uh, you can see the little guard shack in the back uh, there was where the, um, where the Marine would have stood in inclement weather. Uh, we actually have that building uh, in the entrance to Bear Cove Park now. Uh, I did a little restoration on that a few years ago and found on the inside of that door a gentleman's initials carved in the, uh, in the door with 1918 as a date. Are you all familiar with that? That is the commander of the base's house, Quarters A, which is now the Conservatory of Music. That was taken in 1922. Um, they've since obviously added on to that. The conservatory has done a fantastic job up there restoring that building and, and keeping it up. Herbert L. Foss is a Medal of Honor recipient from the Spanish-American War. Um, he, uh, he is not originally from Maine, but I mean from Hingham, but he uh, grew up in Maine and moved to Hingham and, and settled in Hingham after he came back from the uh, Spanish-American War. And um, 
he actually he worked in the depot as a civilian. He had the largest uh, funeral procession in Hingham at the time with military honors. Uh, he was buried at the Fort Hill Cemetery. This is that same pier that uh, we saw in the previous photograph that showed the bridge in the background. This is the pier that was uh, in dire need of some work. This is some of the WPA workers that uh, in the 1930s and stuff, they, um, they were really, everyone was looking for a job after the Depression, so everyone was, was happy and thrilled to get a job. And it was good wages, and they did a great job over there building some of the houses. They re-roofed re a lot of the houses and the buildings, the magazines, and all of the different um, filling houses and stuff that you'll see further on. This is them decking the, uh, redecking the pier down at, by the Back River Bridge. That's a better big picture of the bridge. The pilings, a lot of the pilings that are there, you can still see those today. And there is a, an existing road that, uh, right across from the 99 restaurant, there's an exi existing road that still goes to the old, uh, the old bridge. And there it is completed after a couple of years of work. And, uh, that wooden section is completely gone now. There is a, uh, we do have a fence up back where the grass line is, uh, and um, there's a couple of picnic, picnic tables on that foundation of where that building, building st stood. There's an aerial view from 1940 uh, of the whole depot. You can see Beale Street coming down, cutting that top corner off. Fort Hill Street is along the bottom edge. And um, all of those large rectangular buildings are what they call magazines. That's where they would have stored all of the uh, munitions that was, was made. And they, you really can't see, see it here, but there are what they call barricades. There were three barricades that were built, big cement um, abutments on the side, and they would back the, the trains in that were loaded with munitions in case anything happened, an accident or anything, it would blow straight up in the air, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't hit anything else. So there were three barricades, uh, probably about nine o'clock on, uh, on that map. And you can see the river, and then the Weymouth side, you can still see one of the, um, right under the word ready, under the E, you can see the uh, drive-in movie theater. So a lot of the sailors would go at night, they would go up to that, that end, and they could watch the movie from on this side of the river. <laughs> This is the Marine detachment from uh, 1941. You can see some of the Marine barracks in the back, and this would have been up on the hill where the DPW stands now. This is the uh, VT fuse line that they were talking about earlier. Um, it was a top secret uh, thing for World War II, what it was. Um, it sent a radio wave. They had a little tiny fuse in the, the VT stands for vacuum tube and it had a little tiny fuse inside the cartridge, and when they fired it up in the air, it sent a radio wave out around the projectile, and um, anything that came within that radio wave, the uh, projectile would blow up. It was a proximity fuse, and uh, it cut down the amount of rounds that it took. A round is one bullet. Originally, it took 2,400 rounds to shoot down an enemy plane. And when they, they um, came up with this invention, it cut that down to 400. So it, uh, it really was a, a top secret thing, and they didn't want that to fall in the enemy hands. This is a letter. I don't know if you can read the letter on the side here by General Patton. Um, he said that that was one of the most uh, devastating things in World War II next to the, the atomic bomb. This is a, uh, obviously a Superman magazine from 46, and on the back cover of it is a picture of the uh, radio brain BT fuse. This gentleman here, Norman Connors was uh, stationed at the depot, and um, he actually invented the four-way pallet, which made it so much easier for the gentleman to pick these, these items up and place them down on the, uh, on, the, on the deck of a ship or anything else, because before that, you could only pick them up from front and back, and it was, you know, when they're piling them in there, it made it difficult to, uh, to raise and lower the pallets and go pick them up. So he came up with a four-way pallet and it revolutionized the whole um, 
basically the industry, and uh, he, he went ahead and became a, uh, a magazine. He, he, he had all kinds of inventions after that, and he just uh, he made it big. This is them preparing some of the projectiles to be shipped off. Um, this is one of the filling houses, the F House. Uh, they had a number of filling houses in there. The um, Fire Museum is actually in one of the filling houses that used to be in the depot. Uh, next slide, I think there's another. So what they would do is they would, do, most of them were painting. You know, they painted them up, but they loaded these up and they placed them on the pallets. There's the four-way pallet that you can see right there. You could run the, the forks from the fork truck, truck in from either direction, all four ways. And that's at the D house, or the G filling house, excuse me. Explosive D was a orange powder. And um, when they were doing the filling, they, the people that would come home, my grandfather worked in there. He was actually in that picture of the uh, VT fuse also. And uh, they would come home and they would be covered with this orange tint, you know, from the, uh, from the explosive D. Here's an aerial view of Quarters A, the uh, conservatory again. Uh, pretty nice little place to uh, hang your hat, I guess, if you were a commanding officer with your family. Now, the railroad in there um, went to every building. Every building had a railway and a dock in front of it so that they could deliver the uh, munitions, store them, and then when they needed to go pick them up, they would. everything was all numbered and lettered. If they were in a building, say this was the uh, inside the magazine, they would, have, they would have letters coming down the side, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then in the girders up above, they would have one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you needed to go to two, A, two, it was basically just, um, you know, they would know exactly where to go and pick the stuff up and they could wheel it out. And uh, every, every magazine had a, a loading dock right outside where the train would pull up right in front of it and they could just load it right into the, into the train. They would drive it down to the, um, to the pier, which had its own loading dock. They would drive it right up. They would offload the munitions onto the, uh, onto the pier itself. They had elevators in the pier, built right into the pier, where they could raise and lower to the height of the barge, loaded in the barge. And that's what the green dock house uh, was. It was a records keeping uh, building. They would um, keep track of what went, came and went. <laughs> so the, the railroad tracks, there was a number of miles of railroad tracks in there. These are some of the other, um, these are civilian workers, and you can see they were the emergency electrical workers. They worked on the telephone system, kept all of the, uh, the, the power up and running. Uh, there was a number of workers in there that, um, it, the, the whole place was a city. It had its own telephone exchange. It had its own electrical system. It had its own water system. It had three huge water towers, and it also had two underground water tanks of about 250 million gallons each. So they were up, built up in the highest part of the depot. And uh, so if they, you know, if they lost the towers, they, you know, the water would be um, still, still had pressure in the, uh, in the fire hydrants and everything else. So they had their own fire department, they had their own um, electrical, like I say, telephone workers, electrical workers, uh, water department, everything. This is the Navy band uh, from World War II. You can see most of them are, uh, are black. And um, these are some of the names, some of the big name jazz players were actually stationed at the depot. And they would go around to the different bases and um, into Boston and they would go over to the shipyard and every time they launched the ship they would, they would play, you know, um, play songs. But it, I don't know if any of you recognize any of the names up there, but uh, some of them were pretty well, pretty well known. Now, I don't know if you know that building in the background, um, but this is a uh, either Fourth of July parade, possibly, or Memorial Day, I don't know exactly which, but um, all of the troops participated. I can remember growing up as a kid on Fort Hill Street, every Memorial Day, they would send a group of uh, Marines over and they would fire a salute at each of the cemeteries uh, for uh, Memorial Day. And, uh, 
That's another uh, fairly familiar picture, uh, Talbot's. And that was the Servicemen's Recreation Center. And also, I believe, at the, the um, behind where the post office is now, there was another uh, a famous uh, meeting place for the young ladies and the, and the sailors, called the Rathskeller, I believe it was. And uh, also, the community center was another, um, was another servicemen's hangout. Now, at the, um, this is a, it, at the peak of all activity, this is the personnel that were there. There were about 3,000 civilians. Like I say, there, a lot of them were women at the time because all the men were obviously away or they were deemed unfit for service, but they could still do uh, loading of um, ammunition and stuff. So there were 375 Marines there at, the, at this particular time at the peak, 720 one Navy, and uh, plus or minus, it went up and down all, all over the place. So this was at the peak now. I mean, in, in between wars, it would drop off, sometimes going down to like 50 people, uh, just to keep it up and you know keep everything moving. This is the 50-year plaque. The, uh, 1904 was the date when the Navy put feet on the ground the, at the first opening of the whole thing. And uh, so 1954 would have been the 50th year anniversary. This plaque was in front of the uh, administration building the, that is over on Beale Street, or was on Beale Street, where they built those five or six houses along the left side uh, just recently. It was just tucked in behind there. And uh, the stone that the plaque was on is, is actually still there. Somebody stole the plaque long ago because it was bronze. And, uh, This is uh, the entrance to the depot, obviously, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, somewhere around in there. This one, you really can't tell too much because there's no vehicles in sight. But that was the original Navy sign. The, um, the two posts that that sign used to sit on are still there, as is the lamp post. I don't know if you can really see it that well there. There's a lamp post uh, right in front of the number of the, uh, where the credit union used to be. That's the gatehouse, the uh, cred credit union. Uh, there's a square box up between the peak of that house with a number in it. Um, so this is back in, uh, like I say, 1940, 50 or so. And uh, so this was the gatehouse. My grandfather actually does, supposedly, um, he was a mason and he did a lot of work in the air and supposedly built that, that gatehouse, did some work on that. The credit union started out as a small little section and the section in the back, they actually had three or four overhead garage doors, and they parked the MPs Jeeps inside. And uh, now that is the uh, school department uses that building for their, their, their bus drivers and stuff. They come in and, and do all the paperwork and stuff in there. That's another picture of the gatehouse. Now, this is a little later. This is probably in the 50s. Uh, you can see the... Uh, those, the blinds, the shutters that are on the building with the little anchor cut into them are still, are still there, I believe. And you can see some of the old pickup trucks in the background there. They look like they're in the 50s. Um, and this is a, a uh, Hingham Patriot, Le a Quincy Patriot Ledger article from uh, 1962. You can't really read that, but this is the, uh, the closing of the base, and this one gentleman is doing an inventory on the 16-inch uh, 50 caliber projectiles. And those things are, as you can see, they're over five feet tall and they weigh about 2,200 pounds. And those are the, um, those are fired from the battleships. And they can, they can shoot those, hurl those things out about 20 miles and uh, pretty accurately too, over the horizon. So if you're in a, in a battleship, it makes quite a noise. And if you come to the museum, which is open on the 24th of this month, in the, uh, in the park from 10 to noon. We have videos of the battleships firing the 16-inch uh, guns. And uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a sight. This is the entrance to Bear Cove Park now and in, uh, in by the uh, Model Railroad Club off of Fort Hill Street. This is the main gate. And this was given to the, uh, given to the town by the federal government as used for a, uh, a park to be used by the general public. 
This is a map from John Richardson, who, uh, who, who was the first chairman of the Bearcroft Park Committee. And um, I don't know if you can see it or not, but he, when he did the map, he put, on, put in all these little intricate things of where he found different things. Like he found the, uh, there's a barge, like a 1700 year uh, barge from the 1700s. Um, any of the animals that he saw at the time, he, he would write down. He saw an eagle at a certain time and in a certain place. And uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat the way he, he kind of like, everything is, is there. Little, little Squirrel Hill, uh, you know, different, different things. These are some of the um, pictures of the buildings later, later on after they were decaying before they actually got taken down. And this is uh, inside the ice house, which is close to the conservatory. Um, the ice house, there was a pond right there, and they used to harvest the ice, and they would store it in this building. And the ceiling was stuffed full between the rafters with, um, with sawdust to keep it, use it as an insulation. So it was about, I want to say the roof was probably a good two feet thick, and it was all full of sawdust, and the walls were all insulated. So they could cut that ice, put that ice in there in the winter, and still have ice going in the uh, middle of summer. This is another picture of the uh, Marine Barracks, which is up on top of the hill where the DPW is now. Um, that's the original flagpole, uh, which is long gone. The dog graveyard uh, is up on that hill, too. There's two Marine Corps mascot dogs buried up on that hill. And when they passed away, they were given full military honors with uh, firing a 21-gun salute and the whole bit. Uh, pretty impressive. And there's pictures of those, uh, those at the uh, museum, too. This is inside one of the old barracks that, uh, as it was getting decayed, and you know, people would break in and smash things, and, uh, and it was getting to be a real um, nuisance. So they started tearing them down in about this in the 70s and, and 80s. This is one from the 80s, obviously. You can see the um, Weymouth Port in the, uh, in the background. You can see the, the shipyard with the uh, smokestack over there. The, um, the pier, that's the old World War I pier down by 3A, you can see. Um, the building in the back of that is uh, one of the buildings that was torn down by the state. Actually, that little area was owned by the state. Um, we had a couple of murders take place in that state, on that state property a, a number of years ago. And uh, so they came in and they tore everything down and, and cleaned all that stuff up. There's another picture of the same. And you can still see the, the pier, which was this is uh, actually the World War II pier, and you can see the building um, in the back in the background. Just beyond, in back of the pier is the, is my uh, the Dockhouse Museum. Yeah, the little small one down right. The, that's a shadow, but you can see the little bit to the right, right there. Right there is the uh, Dockhouse Museum, and you can see that's the uh, the pier is still standing at that time. And uh, that was, like I say, four feet off the ground. The railroad, the railroad track went to every one of the magazines. And um, you can still see the remnants of the railroad tracks in places. And there's the, uh, the Dark House Museum. And this is inside. There's a ton, a ton of pictures. Um, this, is, this is fairly old now, this picture. It's fairly old. But that uniform, uh, that was my father's uniform. He was, like I say, stationed here in 1944. Uh, he met my mother, was from Hingham, and he was originally from Georgia. And, um, they hit it off and uh, ended up marrying my mother, and the rest is, as we say, history. <laughs> this is one of the events that takes place over in the, uh, by the museum in the river, they, uh, the Hingham High School regatta team rose up and down the river and they, uh, they were over there in the spring and they're usually practicing and matter of fact they just, uh, they just cleaned all the boats up last week and, and got them out of there. So they, they practice in the river and they have a couple of meets every once in a while where they'll have five or six um, high schools all uh, compete in the river. This is an up-to-date 
map of the Bear, Bear Cove Park. Um, as you can see, the green section is, is Bear Cove Park. The white that you see is mostly the private homes in uh, Hingham Woods, Beals Cove, Conservatory Park. But that was all included in the base at one time. You can see the outline is the Beale Street, Fort Hill Street area. So it was close to 1,000 acres in there. Um, the park itself is about close to 500 now. We just received a few more acres from the state not too long ago after we had the, the, um, the little incident that took place in there. Um, there's a couple of gates. There's a, the, the roadway that comes in off of Fort Hill Street across from the, the uh, railway station is the main entrance to the park. So that's the main entrance to the park. There's also another entrance over on Beale Street by uh, Lynchfield. And the Green Dock House Museum is, you can see that one next to the K and back, right just to the uh, right of the K and back. Down a little, right, right there is the Dock House Museum. All right. All right. I guess I can give it to Jim. Thank you very much. Well, the military history of the annex actually begins with Chief Wampatuck. He was uh, killed in a raid by the Mohawk Indians in 1669, and they were aided by the French militia. And Wampatuck means white deer, and he's, he was born in 1627. His father was Chickatawbit, and he died in 1633. And Chickatawbit means uh, house of fire, and they were from the Massachusetts tribe, and that means uh, dwellers of the hills. So apparently they made two big deeds, and one was 1655 and 1665, where most of the South Shore was trans transferred to the early settlers. So early in uh, July, the United States uh, felt that they were eventually going to get into the World War II because they were aiding the British over in the Battle of the Atlantic. And um, so they decided to take over some properties over there, and their 60 homes were taken. And uh, they needed about, um, I guess, 3,700 acres for their operation. And the towns were Hingham, Coasset, Situate, and Norwell. And so this is uh, one of the homes that, um, that was over there. And there's three still left. In fact, if you go through the front gate to Wampaduck State Park and take a left, there's three still left. These are the barricaded sliding, sidings being constructed. There were 20 put in, and they'd um, use those to park trains in overnight. They were 300 feet long, and they were constructed in such a way to send the blast up. Okay, and this is what it looks like now. Some of them are totally filled up. Okay, so this is the U-87, and uh, it was in Boston Harbor in 19, let's see, 1942, and it sunk two ships and mined Boston Harbor, and 92 people died. And um, that was at the, the beginning of the uh, Battle of the Atlantic, and it was such a, a horrific experience in the beginning that uh, throughout the war, I think that within the 200 mile limit, the Germans sunk 20 of our ships, causing 303 uh, deaths and 819 survivors. And um, as far as ships sunk and lives lost, the first, first six months of the war were deadlier than Pearl Harbor. So in the beginning of the war, one ship was sunk every four hours. But eventually that uh, was turned around in 1943 when they had um, more anti-submarine measures, and they broke the code, too. OK, this is uh, from a, a coal ship that was sunk by the U-853, and it was off of Rhode Island. It was about five miles from shore. And uh, on these uh, freighters, sometimes they'd be armed. And this one was a five-inch shell, 
and it's an inspection slip, and you can see on the lower half the, the initials of the people that worked on it or inspected it from the depot. So the ship was sunk and 12 people died, and eventually, that was um, in 45, on May 5th, they caught the U-boat 853 the day later, and they sunk that. But that U-boat also sunk the um, USS Eagle off of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and 49 sailors were killed on that. So, and this is one of the explosive magazines. There's still, there's still some there. There's about six left, but they're about half as big as this. But they're constructed in such a way that if they did have an explosion, they'd be sent up. The power of the explosion would go up. There were 188 of them at the time. Now six left. So this is a classification yard. So when the trains came in, the first thing they'd do is they'd um, decide what goes where within the depot. And they'd come here and there'd be two tracks on one side, well actually four, and the same thing on the other side. And then they'd be sent out according to what goes where, fuses or rockets. So, and these are three engineers that work there, uh, Herc, Conway, and Spillane. Herc was from Hingham, Herc Henningsen. And uh, you'll see in the next slide, that inscription's still there. It's um, near the transfer building. It's only about a quarter of a mile away, and it says Friday the 13th, 1956. <laughs> they put it on there. And here's the transfer building. So when the, the trains would come down and they'd uh, transfer their load from the train to the uh, trucks, they were parked along the uh, kind of like a loading zone to the right. And that's what it's going on there. And sometimes the trucks would come to the transfer building and they would take warheads to New London, Connecticut. Okay, that's my father with VT fuses. And that, that's where the VT fuse operation occurred. And the VT fuses, there are five different types, radio, acoustic, optical, pressure, and magnetic. And this is the boiler house. There were two of them there, and they were coal-fired. A rocket motor building. And attached to this on the left, they had like a, a walkway that was covered, and all the lockers were there. And uh, on the other side was this overhead uh, conveyor belt that led to the powder house and went over the street and also the railroad tracks. And down from that uh, walkway that was covered, the lockers, uh, went to the lunch room. That's it there. These pictures were taken, I'd say, about uh, maybe a little over 10 years ago. And they took all these buildings down about eight years ago, six to eight years ago. This is the inhibitor building, and this is where they applied inhibitors on the rockets. And what that did is there are plastic strips and it would cut the burn down so it's a steady flow. Otherwise, you'd have an explosion or burn off too quick. So you'll see in the next slide what the inhibitor is. It's like a, a cruciform with a propellant. And there are the plastic inhibitors that would control the burn. So, and then, and that's what the people would do. Mainly women worked here. They were applied in these booths here and they had these ducts above and it'd take all the fumes out supposedly to um, and back and there was a fan house in back of this building. But the problem was the fumes were so overwhelming that uh, when my mother worked there they had to open all the windows and doors even in the winter and they had to operate this whole thing with their winter clothes on, big coats, because the fumes are so intense. And a lot of them got, from what I heard from a, an inspector, TNT heart, which is, um, I looked it up, and the TNT heart is like a troponin uh, protein given off by the heart when it's under stress. So a lot of them had that uh, particular problem. And this is the administration building that was, <coughs> as you come through the main gate, it was on the left, and it started out as a construction building uh, just for the construction work, is, but they turned it into an ad building, admin building. And this started off uh, as Guided Missile Service Unit 215 headquarters, and they'd uh, service three different 
well, actually two different types of missiles there. And uh, after that closed down, this, this was built in the late 50s, and then in the, the 60s it became a production for the landmines, the XM-47 landmines from Vietnam, and then after that it was the headquarters for the 184th Infantry Brigade. And they took that down in 2005. This is George Neat. He was one of the uh, guided missile officers that worked at that gumshoe plant. He died last February. And this is one of the missiles that was uh, uh, serviced there, the Tara missile. It's about 15 feet long, 13.5 inches wide. And the other one is the Terrier. And the Terrier, the Terrier missile actually um, shot down a MiG, and a couple of MiGs in uh, Vietnam from the USS Biddle and the USS Sterrett. There's one there. And what they do at the Goddard Missile, Goddard Missile Service Unit, they would um, test the missiles. <clears throat> they'd um, test them here, and then they'd bring them out to the ships out in the Boston Harbor and load them there through a barge. And there's George Neat in 2014, and the guy on the left is Steve Gammon. He was the park director at the time. There's a shell there on the right, and that was found on the back river by uh, my friend of ours. He was a uh, Vinnie Chapetta. <laughs> Anyways, he was clam digging, and he used to be a crane operator at Four River. Okay. This is the burning area. It was cleaned up about eight years ago, but they burnt off a lot of the powder there. Cordite and uh, that uh, deep powder, which is ammonium perchlorate. And I looked that up as far as um, hazardous material, and deep powder uh, causes kidney cancer, and that's what my father died of in, uh, when he was 65 years old. So we think it might have been through this place. We're not sure, of course, but um, that was a speculation. And they had a lot of fires here, fires and explosions. And sometimes the local fire departments were brought in to put them out. Okay. So here are the contaminants being removed. So that was about eight years ago. And this is um, a ship that was sunk on May 11th, 1944. And it was sunk off of Boston Harbor about 14 miles. They were burning off rockets and they had a, a fire and then a big explosion, and it sunk, and out of a crew of 31, 17 died, and the whole Hingham contingent, um, 11 guys, crewmen, sailors, they were all killed, and they were all blacks. And at that time, a lot of the black servicemen were given um, uh, menial jobs, like stewards handling ammunition, and uh, there was another explosion in poor Chicago and California where over 200 of them were, were killed through an explosion. And um, a lot of them refused to go back to work after that explosion and they put them in prison. <laughs> Eventually they were released after about a month. But that was in 1944. Okay. And uh, Stanford Seneca was a, a full-blooded uh, chief from the Seneca tribe from New York. And he died at the ammunition depot because he inhaled fumes when he was cleaning shells. And Frank Krause, he owned uh, Bill's Outboard on 3A. And he was uh, um, working at the mine anchor building and he screwed down the, I guess it's an ox, too tight, and it blew up in his chest. And when I went to talk to him over there, he, he said he kept on getting the fragments of that shell out of his chest. Every now and then they'd surface on his skin and take him out. So that was in 1953. And there's Stanford Sedeker. He's next to my father. My father's on the, there's Stanford, there's my father on the right. Okay. These, um, a mixing building, that's during the Vietnam War. From 1967 to 68, they manufactured mines for the war. There was the XM 47 gravel mine project. And those four buildings on the left were mixing buildings, and they'd use Freon 
with alcohol. And uh, the idea of the mine was to, if it was soaked in Freon, it was inert. So once it dried out, it became armed. And um, they would assemble them in the building on the right. But they'd, they had a lot of explosions there. And um, I guess on the conveyor belt, where the mines were, they'd explode. And sometimes the employees would have to go home with air eggs. So eventually they had a big accident in Hanover. And uh, oh, there's the mine it, itself. And how it operated is that they'd be packed in these big pods, and the helicopter would be um, loaded with them, with the pods, and it'd take off. And over the area of the drop zone, it'd pitch up, and they'd all fall out. And uh, the, the theory behind this is they wanted to create a perimeter around a down pilot so the Viet Cong NVA would be able to pick them up. And they'd also use it in Quezon and also the uh, demilitarized zone in Vietnam. So eight, it was three to eight minutes, they'd become armed. So this is another mixing building here. It's still there. You can see the blast walls. And so they had a big explosion here at Hanover and King Street. And I re remember my father saying that that place is uh, fireworks, they call it, was very unsafe. And he said, someday they're going to have an explosion. And lo and behold, they did. And one man was killed, and 15 were injured. And I said, see, I told you. But the Hingham guys were supposed to go over on that day. But uh, uh, luckily, lucky for them, the bus broke down because <laughs> it was so cold. It was in December of 1967. So after the explosion, they were brought in to uh, defuse the mines and ship them out, and they all got accommodations from the Army for doing it. So this is Bunker 9. It's still over there, and that's where they had the nuclear depth charge. It was a NASROC missile. And the way it worked is they'd fire them out of a, from a destroyer, and you'd come down on a parachute, and then go in the water and travel around and seek out its spray and explode. But they just continued using this, uh, 1989. They don't carry them anymore. And this is the guy that was in charge of it, one of them. He's a, called a snapper. That was one of the um, classifications. And he was, the next guy was our neighbor in Rockland. <laughs> he was a leading man. And uh, he was also in charge of that bunker. A great neighbor. And this person here on the right, he's still alive, Ron Mead. He brought the uh, nuclear depth charges up from Quonset Point, Rhode Island. And one time he was caught for, um, uh, almost given a ticket for driving too slow because he couldn't go over 35 miles per hour. <laughs> and Sammy Amonte, everyone knows him. But um, Sammy's nephew, Tony Amonte, I don't know whether you remember him or not. He was a famous hockey player for the Blackhawks. And uh, Tony Amonte's cousin is Charlie Coyle, plays for the Bruins now. And it turns out Charlie Coyle's grandmother was, um, uh, was in the same wedding party as Ron Mead's wife. She was the best maid. So anyways, there's a connection there. It was a you know, small world story. George Bartlett um, witnessed the explosion at the Mine Anchor Building that injured Franny Krauss. And he was also in the Coastal Guard before the war. And he remembers over in, um, I think, Hog Island, Spinnaker Island now, they had two 16-inch guns. And they said they only fired them once. And it broke all the windows in that part of the hull. <laughs> Leo Parenti was a former supervisor. And uh, he was full of a lot of funny stories. He was a a World War II veteran, and when he was over in Europe, he captured a, a SS major, and he was wanted for uh, war crimes, and they eventually hung him. And this Peter Stonis, he was a, um, a crane operator over at the depot, and he was the one that took out a lot of the ordnance from the back river with a clamshell, and he also operated a train. He was a Guadalcanal veteran, too. This is Ruth Bates. Uh, some of her family came to hang them in 1635. They're buried right behind here, Caleb and uh, Clement. 
Um, her claim to fame is she worked for uh, Captain Bates and commanded Dunning. And after Hingham, she went to uh, Washington and she dated this German general. His name was Gerstoff. And she also had another boyfriend at the same time, Tom. And uh, Gerstoff was famous for um, trying to, he made an attempt on Hitler's life, but he survived because the theory was he was going to tie fuses on his body, grab Hitler, and explode himself and kill the Fuhrer. And that was in 43. But Hitler came in and went so quickly, wasn't able to catch up with him. So he survived the war. And she kind of fell in love with him. But then her boyfriend at the time said, you're not going to date any damn German. <laughs> and this is Admiral Jim Gorman. He um, remembers when he was over in Korea using a rocket with the Hingham stamp on it. Fred Zimbalen. He was over stationed here in 1943. He remembers the time when the cruiser Richelieu got torpedoed and they um, put the crew over at um, the annex and they alternated um, a French sailor with a, a marine and they communicate with sign language and all the girls in Hingham were in love with the Frenchmen because they had these colorful uniforms that red pom-pom on top. And he also told me that um, the Frenchmen would carry cheese in the belts and use a paring knife to, whenever they got hungry, they would eat some cheese. And also he pulled guard duty over there in 43. And he had a horse named Tony. And sometimes Fred would fall asleep going back to the stable, but the door was too low. And when he'd go through the, the door, he would knock him off his saddle. <laughs> so Fred was a, he went to Saipan, and he, he, um, he earned the Purple Heart. He was the only survivor out of a patrol of eight. And this is the park as it is today. Let's see it. In 1967, it was created with 2,800 acres. Today, it's 3,750. So that's it. Thank you, uh, and I think our speakers would be happy to take questions. Uh, there are a lot of terms and people and places mentioned, so uh, if you want to direct your question to Scott, Jim, or either of them. They were tested twice, but they never used them. Tested locally? No. In Prob desert. Probably in the Pacific. Well, the base closed its doors in 1962. The Navy held it in reserve for 10 years. So in 1972, the gov federal government started selling off different portions of land. They, you know, Beals Cove, Hingham Woods, uh, Conservatory. To whom did they sell it? They sold to individual um, con contractors that wanted to build, you know, build homes. And, you know, uh, like I said, Beals Cove was all condos and, um, Conservative. It was given to the town. It was given to the town with a stipulation that it be used for a, a park in perpetuity, for uh, recreational and educational use. That's why you had you had a lot of the buildings in there were um, uh, educational along Beale Street. There were some buildings that were for like a twenty year, twenty or thirty year lease. They had they were given the buildings for 20 years, and then after 20 years, 30 years, whatever it was, they could sell whatever it is. And that's why you've got these other new, new places cropping up all of a sudden. Um, you know, the 30 years is up. There was a um, project turnabout was one of them. Um, after the 20 years was up, the, the uh, Hastings, you know, bought the property and turned that into a, you know, back river townhomes and Yes, um, yes, uh, the annex, which is Wampatuck, the annex was added on in World War II. Yeah. Um, the, the depot was started in 1904 for World War I, and it was not big enough when World War II came about. It wasn't big enough to hold everything here. Uh, 
I'm not exactly sure. I think it was all, all run by the same person, and uh, but they, they went back and forth. Sandra Owens actually grew up in, in uh, the depot. My father actually came here in 1918 as a Navy man. So he was here during World War I. And um, his position during World War II was he was in charge of making sure the munitions were available at 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's what brought my family to Ham. And we lived at Quarters L, which is um, now adjacent to where Lynchfield is. And it's where those new apartments or condominiums or whatever they are that have gone up there. And I'll just say personally, they remind me of military barracks that were there <laughs> at the time when I lived there. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> 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 but as a child growing up, I started first grade here in Hingham and lived there until I graduated from high school in 1957. Um, as Scott said, it was a little self-contained community. Um, there was a swimming pool up where the barracks were. Um, so we had swimming in the summertime. There were movies. Um, there was a different movie every night. If I wanted to go to the movies, I had to have my homework done. That was when I got into high school. Um, the war I remember most was the Korean War. Um, and by that time, I was a young teenager. The Marines that were stationed there were not much older than I was. My girlfriend and I were just talking about this the other day. I remember most of the Marines that got stationed there came from Pan Camp Pendleton or Camp Lejeune. They then were being shipped out to Korea. So my girlfriend and I would know Marines that were only three or four years older than we were. And I can remember talking to them and sending some of them off to go to war. And at the post exchange that was at the depot at the time, we would go over maybe twice a month, and they would have the killed, wounded, and missing in action posted there. And many, not many, but some of the names that were there were men that had been stationed in Hingham um, and went off to Korea. Um, I, I'll just say we also had, um, on um, Armed Forces Day, they would have a, a big ceremony over at Lynch Field, what is now Lynch Field. And they would um, have fire, what do they call those? Flamethrowers. Flamethrowers. They would demonstrate flamethrowers. They would demonstrate um, other kinds of ammunition, so, um, uh, rifles. Uh, they would have a big parade. The Navy and the Marine Corps together would have a parade. Also, behind my house, which was Quarters L, um, up on a hill, there was a fitness area. And my girlfriend and I used to like to go up there and see whether we could do what the military was doing. And they had the barbed wire that was low to the ground and you'd have to get on your belly and go under the barbed wire. They had the rope um, pulls. We have to pull ourselves up over the um, barrier. They had um, the tires that you would have to go through. So my girlfriend and I would go there and see whether we could do what the Marines were doing. Um, and I, it was a wonderful place for me to grow up. I had a thousand acres to explore. And when I was old enough to ride my bike, I explored that land all the time. It was just a, a wonderful thing. There were, at times, there were um, times when parents did not want their children to come to the depot because they were afraid. I mean, there was always this feeling that it could be a target. So during World War II, I, there were not too many children that would come to the depot because their parents were afraid of what could happen. And during the Korean War, fortunately for me, um, I had friends that lived off the base, so that's where I would go. But I have just fabulous memories of living on that land and exploring it. And um, I'm so happy that Quarters A is a conservatory. That was the best thing that ever happened to that building. I played in that building with two of the um, children that lived there. 
and I just gave Scott some pictures today. I recently connected up with two gals. Both of them had, their fathers were um, the captains on the ammunition depot. They both went to Hingham High School. They graduated in 1959, and they just had their 60th class reunion up at the country club about two weeks ago. And um, I hadn't seen them in 65 years. So, um, and we were, our pictures were as babysitters at the Naval Ammunition Depot when we were all teenagers. So um, Scott now has the pictures and they'll, he'll put It'll them in so, the museum. Yeah, in the museum. <laughs> that was the other thing I was so happy about. We finally made a museum because Hingham has a rich military history, but not too many people know about it. And um, now with Scott, between the GAR Hall and um, the Dog House, we have a good assortment of military memorabilia that really does do uh, tribute to what happened here in Hingham during, well, World War I when my dad came here and then World War II and Korea. So that's my story. <laughs> I should mention that also at Town Hall now, we have a wonderful exhibit about the shipyard. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, a number of places in town you can visit. Yes, there was. It was built in 1944. And on opening day, it served 1,400 people. It was built uh, for the civilian workers. The, the Navy and Marine Corps personnel had um, the mess hall that they could eat at and the other Civilian workers either had to brown bag it or bring a lunchbox or whatever. So they talked the Navy into putting in that, that restaurant. Two twenty-eight. So it wouldn't have been the depot. Uh, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was Wampatuck because it was after the yeah Wampatuck. Yeah, they had. Yeah, they they had uh, the army was up there for a while afterwards uh, doing. Uh, they had helicopters and stuff coming in on some of the uh, roadways and stuff. Uh, they had. Yeah, I think it was from 71 to 82 they were there. Okay. So, and they had guards. Plenty of, I mean, I went through a gate one time and they caught me, so. <laughs> well, they used a lot of the same equipment. They had actually Route 3A, there was, a, there was an overpass. Uh, that the trains and the cars could go underneath the, um, the overpass where the uh, Route 3A was remained open. So they did use the same trains, they used the same, um, some of the same vehicles, and maybe the same guards. Well, they had civilian uh, police also, but the Marines pretty much handled the security end of it, and the Navy handled, kept, kept the, uh, the base up and running. The Navy was the security. They had uh, Marines on horseback patrolling the, the perimeter of the fence. And later on, I can remember as a child growing up on Fort Hill Street, the fence was in my backyard, and the Marine guards would actually walk the perimeter. You know, every 15 minutes, another guy would go by. They also cut the top of Fort Hill down. If you go over Fort Hill Street, where the cemetery is, you can see there's a, there's a, there's a uh, right at the top of the hill, there's a, it's been cut down about 20 feet so that the trucks could make it up and over the hill. And yeah, that and was they, done in the 50s. And they said they did the new Bridge Street uh, just to cut down on the time that it would take to go around like through Weymouth. Right. They did, they did do uh, the new bridge and they did cut that hill down to, to make transportation so they didn't have to go through Hang Square for one thing with um, you know, the stuff on the trucks. Uh, Scott, did the, the Captain Delory ever tell you the story of the fire they had there? They had a number of fires there. Huh? Well, for those of you that know Bob Delory, who's a very well-known citizen, he was a captain in the fire department for years, and he related a story to me. Uh, I'm not sure if he was directly involved with it or not, but right where Carlson Fields are was the fire station. There were two fire stations, one at, in, uh, at uh, Mainside Park and one at the Annex, manned by civilians. And the, uh, they, they worked 24-hour tours of duty, which is 
uncommon in those days. But, uh, and they changed shifts at six o'clock in the morning as Bob related the story to me. And one morning at 6 a.m., the oncoming shift over in, in Mainside Park, the fire station was right where Carlson Fields was, came in and said, what time did the fire come in? And said, what are you talking about? I says, look out the window. <laughs> there was a building directly across the street from the fire station, and that relationship would be like from here to Whitney Gordon's. Direct line of sight, the building was like 40 by 60, two stories. It burned flat with the firefighters in the building sleeping and they never knew it. <laughs> and just for the record, that did not happen on my watch. <laughs> but uh, another thing is I believe today's the birthday of the U.S. Marine Corps? It is, it is. Happy birthday. Yeah. Semper Fi. Fred has a question and thank you for your service, sir. Okay. Right, you Can I stay sitting? Can I stay sitting? Hi, Jim. Hi. I was one of those Marines you're talking about down there that pulled in as soon as the war started. I joined the, I joined the Marine Corps when well, the war was declared December 7, 1941. I joined December 15th, something like that, 1941. So I guess you say, well, that's a long time. How old would you be? I'm 94 now, so. Uh, <laughs> I did it, and uh, I went through a boot camp and I made first uh, guard or station duty was here in the Hingman Naval Ammunition Depot. And uh, I must have pulled in here somewhere at the very end of February uh, 1942. I was here uh, to 42 and up to the latter part of maybe 43. And uh, I had some nice experiences here and so forth, you know. Uh, I was one of those, I was one of those guards that was on that horse you're talking about running around and so forth. And uh, how I got onto the horse, I only coming into that place for the first time was that uh, I walked post when they first got here. When we first got here, uh, we didn't have rifles or anything. We, we had 45 pistols and a, uh, a sheepskin coat. And uh, I was out on post the first night, and uh, I wasn't quite used to all this cold weather. And they found me laying on the ground, shivering in a fetal position and so forth. They said, <laughs> well, he, he's no good for walking post, and we'll find something else for him. <laughs> well, we'll put him on mounted, which is horse patrol, what we call it, the mounted. And uh, they said the horse will keep him warm. Well, <laughs> the mounted, you, when you you lived in the you lived in the, the stables with the horses up there, but it was, it was up on a knoll somewhere. I looked for it, and I I don't recognize it anymore, you know. But uh, I. Uh, Drove these horses. I was the guy Jim was talking about. Uh, I was on this 12 to 4 watch uh, and getting back in the 4 o'clock in the morning. I was getting a little drowsy and so forth. I was on the saddle. You went up a little, a little ramp and there was a door there where you would get off and put your horse inside. Well, I was drowsy and I kind of missed that. And as Jim told you, I was on it when he went through the door, and it caught me right in the chest and knocked me right off the horse. <laughs> his, his name was Tony, and I went in and I spoke to him in the stable, and he didn't even give me a nip. A nip. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I, I was there, um, uh, well, we opened the annex, as we call it, the Wampatuck State Park, and when they opened the annex, uh, and we pulled men from the main depot, which is where I was. And uh, when we went over, we lived in a civilian house for a while. And there was three gates, as I recall there. One was the Levitt Street Gate, one was the Beechwood Street Gate. The other was the main gate, where the administration building was. So uh, we, just, we lived for the first uh, two or three weeks in a civilian house over there. and. Uh, 
our first duty was to make sure all the civilians got out of their house before they start locking it up. And we were, we were doing fine with that. Everybody was leaving, everything was good, except this one old couple at the end near the Beechwood Street, the Beechwood, uh, there's a big ramp there now, or a mound or something, you can't get through, but it used to be a gate, you go right into Beechwood, it's the other section of Cohasset. And these people lived in a little bungalow, almost to that gate area, and they were an old cover, and they wouldn't move. So they told us, uh, go down there and get, tell these people they gotta get out, you know. So at the time, for uh, a, uh, a weapon piece at the time that they issued us was a rising submachine gun. And uh, there was eight of us, and each of us had a machine gun. And so we come as a force, show of force, knocked on the door and said, look folks, you know, you gotta leave here now, you gotta go, yeah. And he w closed the door, came back out with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, now wait a minute, sir, you know, we, we don't want to get rough with you. He said, get off my property. So we turned around, we said to this uh, sergeant who was in charge of the group, I said, what do we do? He says, back off, back off. We backed off. And so <laughs> here we are, eight Marines with machine guns and this poor old man with a shotgun. And, <laughs> What are we supposed to do, shoot them? <laughs> no way. <laughs> so we don't have any authority to go and do anything physical to them. So uh, we reported to the commanding officer. The commanding officer called the chief of police. <laughs> chief of police had to go down and get rid of them. <laughs> that was the funny thing. <laughs> Anyhow, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, I want to thank our speakers for all the time they took going through their really extensive collection of photos and maps and stories and uh, encourage you to go to the Green Dock Museum. Uh, also, the Friends of Wampatuck has a wonderful newsletter that, that Jim puts out that has also really terrific history of, of the time uh, that we talked about today. And I have something to give each of you. I'd just like to say we have loosely folders full of pictures. And the Navy took pictures of everything. One for each of you. Oh. Now when you uh, walk around the parks, you can be adorned with a cap that says Hingham Historical Society. Oh, great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for having me here. It's great.